Welcome to the Speakeasy, Mixing Your Passions, a fuel production. We will be taking you on the blind query trip, where we will do a blind tasting. The host will guide you through that, as well as answer queries from you, the listener, about whiskey and golf. Enjoy. Hey, Speakeasy members, this is Brian Bailey here bringing you a new episode. I think the really cool part about all this right now is we've got, I've done a couple weeks of this and I'm starting to get my flow and figure out how exactly I want to run the show. So what you're going to see is basically a four-week cycle. Uh, week one will be education of golf and whiskey. Uh, week two will be a tasting cocktail piece. Week three will be the speakeasy happy hour where we'll talk whiskey, golf, more just sitting back with a friend, uh, enjoying a good dram. And then week four will be what I'm going to call the blind query. So what we're going to do is we're going to take questions from you, and I've gotten a bunch of questions here over the last gosh, 10 days, kind of amazed. People actually asking me, big moron, um, questions about whiskey and, of course, golf. I know more about golf. Uh, but I've gotten some questions there, so I'm going to share with the speakeasy questions. But also what we're going to do is do a blind tasting, hence the, hence the blind query, right? Well, query for us in the data wor world is... You know, we query different databases to get information. Blind means we don't know what we're going to do, so there's going to be questions about this. So the blind query, I think, is the perfect segue into today's episode. So this is our first speakeasy of the blind uh, query. Coming up next month or next week, uh, we're going to start diving into the main five and talk about how Irish whiskey is made uh, and then do a, basically an entire four-episode run on Irish whiskey. Then we're going to go to Scotch. Then we're going to go to American, bourbon, and then we're going to do Canadian, then we'll do Japanese. So right there, you're looking at about a 20-week cycle of information. So that's going to take us, you know, what's that, 4, 20, that's, that's going to put us five months in. So that's going to put us into the winter months, which will be perfect. But again, you'll kind of see this will be the rotation of what we're trying to do. So without further ado, let's jump into the blind. So what we're going to do is we're going to pour a blind. Uh, right now, I'm actually going to use... The blind barrel guys, I get no money from this, no anything. Uh, I discovered these guys online. I thought it was a really cool concept, really cool project. So if this is something you wanna do out there and join me in uh, tasting the uh, blind barrels, do it. Like I said, I, I received no money. So inside, when you open it up, it actually gives you a tasting wheel, which I'll actually use that uh, because that's pretty cool. Um, they give you a kind of write up of what's going on and then they give you your one and a half ounce samples. And then they give you an actual barcode to scan, so that way you can actually look at what the actual tasting notes are and who, who you're drinking. And we'll go ahead and start with A. They give us four choices, so we will start with A. Cool thing is there's a nice bottle. Uh, these bottles will be reused for something, I'm sure. So again, we will be doing the blind barrel taste here. Uh, I know absolutely nothing about this. Let me run over here and grab my phone. So when we're ready to scan the barrel, we'll know exactly what's going on. Sorry about that. So we got blind barrel here. We got A. That's all I know. So let's dive in here and open it up. It smells sweet. So for all you that have been following and been doing whiskeys for a while, when we smell sweet, who do we immediately think of? I'm not going to tell you, but I definitely have an idea in my head immediately, right? Uh, they do a lot of craft uh, distillery, so a lot of smaller um, state, uh, not the big boys. So the really cool thing is I'm not gonna get the manufacturer. And with blind tasting, I'm nowhere near that good anyways. But what I'm gonna try to do is see if I can sneak a little proof, try to figure out how strong uh, the alcohol count is. I'm gonna try to get uh, the main genre. Is it a malt, single malt, is it a PD blend, is it a bourbon, is it a Canadian, is it a Japanese, or, you know, like, is it a rye, is it a, you know, kind of that path, see how good I'm at that, and see if I can get some tasting notes. Um, so, what we're going to do is, we'll, I'm going to take the smell, and then I'm going to answer my first three questions. We're going to taste and do finish, talk about that, and then we'll answer my next three questions on golf. And then uh, wrap the show up with maybe some rapid fire questions, some smaller, more fun ones I've gotten as well. So, so via the nose, 
mm, I get sweet. And I also get kind of a brown sugar note. But I'm also getting fruit, like dark fruit. So I'm getting sugar, brown sugar, sweet, and dark fruit. So in my head, what is that? What am I anticipating? I'm anticipating a bourbon or an American whiskey, uh, depending on how it was finished. With American whiskeys, I'm thinking probably a finished barrel of some sort because I'm getting strong fruit notes. So really strong dark fruit. So that's making me thinking like a finished in a sherry or a port kind of thing. But smells really good. All right, I'm, I'm going to lie. I'm going to take a little sip. Hmm. Color-wise, what do we have? I would say kind of like a not, a, not dark, not light, somewhere in between, kind of like a maple syrup. <coughs> I would call this maybe a pale, palish amber. So again, it's, it's not a, it's a good color. My guess would be probably in that, you know, most bourbons, three to six year period. Um, that's kind of what I would typically see. Um, color, you got to be careful. You know, we could talk legs and proof. Um, don't see a lot of legs. It's kind of sticking to the bottle. Um, so that probably tells us possibly a higher proof. Um, from my little sip, it is definitely not 80 proof. I get that. I get a really good bite of, of alcohol. So I'm saying proof will be high, but we'll get into that in a minute. Um, so smell wise, what we're really looking at is it's, it's a, it has sweeter notes. I'm, I'm tasting darker fruits, cherries, plums uh, are smelling. And then again, like I said, there's a sugar component. We'll leave it there for a minute and let's jump over here. And I see a leg coming down and they're not thin and they're not fast. So again, that kind of gives us an idea of proof. So three whiskey questions I've gotten in the last week. I try to answer all these. I have actually sent direct messages back, uh, things like that. But the uh, number one question I thought was funny. Uh, what makes you so smart that you think you can create a video on whiskey and golf? Well, I don't think I'm smart. I think I'm so stupid that I think I can get away with this. Uh, golf wise, I've, I've been doing golf for over 20 years, coaching at the highest levels. Um, short game putting. I was a golf coach collegiately for 17 years, working the entire facet of the game, preparing for tournaments, getting players there, travel, all that stuff. So I have an, a very good knowledge of golf. And again, golf questions to me come very, very easy. Uh, but what I have basically discovered was whiskey, and I've really enjoyed this part. It gives me something to new to dive into, to learn about. I'm always learning with golf. I had an aha moment a couple days ago. Uh, so I'm always learning inside of golf and teaching. But more so, I think, again, it's not that I'm smart enough to create a whiskey podcast. I think I'm dumb enough to give it a shot. So uh, if you're dumb enough to follow, welcome. We're perfect for each other. Um, but again, my journey is just starting. I'm going to make mistakes. I'm going to screw things up. So be it. Correct me. I've already gotten one correction from a video. I misspoke and I said, hey, you know, that was our fifth tour in Japan and things were getting a little loose. So, I, you know, again, I will make mistakes and I will correct those, go back and re-edit if I need to. But more so than not, I'm just sharing what I enjoy to do. So if you, if, if you want to join me on this endeavor, welcome. Glad you're here. So I thought that was cool. I think the other question I got is, it was basically talking about what does whiskey look like when it comes out of the distilling process. Uh, what you'll see a lot of times, and I, I did a whiskey tasting expo a couple weeks ago where I actually tasted white dog. White dog is actually the whiskey, the mash, the fermentation, all that coming through the stills before it has been aged. And it's a clear liquid. So all whiskeys are clear until they reach the barrel. Barrel color, barrel gives color to whiskey and gives a lot of the flavor notes. So the White Dog is very strong, vodka-y, I mean, just clear spirit, no real flavor, not a lot of excitement going on. That's what you get in the White Dog. So to me, White Dog is, you know, even back in the old days, this would be kind of more of your moonshines. Now, granted, most moonshines use sugars and not whole grains and don't go through the whole process. But again, to me, uh, out of the distilling process, it becomes, it's a clear liquid. 
it tends to be much more vodka y taste, much more. Again, you taste the alcohol and not, you can taste some of the sweetness from the corn or the, whatever the mash is, the rye, but more, not, more than not, it's just a white, clear, vodka-y type thing. So like I said, this color right here comes due to the aging in the barrel process. Last question is, best way for you to be able to sample flavors? Whiskey bars, airplane bottles, bars and, you know, just bars in general. Uh, these guys at the blind taste or the blind barrel, I think is really cool. There's a bunch of companies that do it online. I don't know anything about them. I took a wing and a prayer on this group and it seems to work really. I kind of like what their concept is. Um, there's tons of ways to start, have a friend that has a whiskey collection. You bring a bottle over, they share theirs, you share, you taste, you talk and you learn that way. So again, the best way to start learning your, uh, about whiskeys and trying different whiskeys is go taste whiskeys. That's what we do, right? So those are my first three main questions, and yes, I am. I, I hope those were entertaining enough in their in their own mind. So I got my uh, tasting wheel here that they or the tasting chart that they actually gave you, and I will post my review on this online as well. So again, I'm gonna take another. Same smells. Immediately proof wise, I'm going wild turkey proof, 100, 101, 105. Not at the high end, it's not 120s. It's not that much alcohol bite, but it is not an 80 Irish triple distilled. It does have some alcohol flavor. <coughs> Sorry. Woo, nice. I do get vanilla and I get an oaky taste. I also get sweet right out the gate. We know it's a bourbon or an American whiskey of some sort, but I'm definitely getting sweet out the gate. Maple syrup, brown sugar-ish, turns right into vanilla and oak finish. And I, I start to get a little of that clovey, dark baking stuff at the end, right? So I don't know what that is. I would actually say maybe cherries, maybe cinnamon and clove at the back end. Uh, let's take one more little sip here. Definitely got a lot of cinnamon on that one, a lot of clove. So again, I get the sweet out the gate. So again, I'm thinking bourbon. Definitely thinking corn is the number one component of the mash. Not a rye whiskey. It's not a smooth Irish. It's not a smoky scotch. Could be Canadian, but I think this company only deals with Americans. Uh, distillers, craft distillers. So I'm thinking U.S. So to me, this is definitely a bourbon-ish, bourbon or, or a American whiskey finished in a, like I said, I'm getting that sweetness at the end. I'm getting that port sherry wine. My wife does a lot of wine, so I drink a lot of wine as well. God, I sound like an alcoholic. I'm not. I drank for the shows and maybe once a week outside of the shows, so I'm not a big drinker, but I do enjoy drinking a good glass of wine or whiskey nowadays. Nice. Definitely. So out the gate, we smelled sweet. We smelled brown sugar. I got a little bit of dark fruit, cherry, plum. Tasting it, still get the syrupy. I get less brown sugar, more like a maple syrup. Goes into vanilla, oak. I can definitely get the oak flavor. So again, I'm thinking this is probably aged anywhere from three to six years just because I'm getting some oak to it. And I get some baking spices at the end. We'll talk about the finish after we go three questions on golf, right? So one of the questions I get all the time, and I actually got it through the speakeasy, they're learning about whiskey as well, but they asked me, as a young coach, uh, what advice would you give me? Uh, I've, I've shared a bunch of stuff on this inside of Fuel, which is our video platform for golf. So if you're a whiskey drinker and you love golf, you need to go to Fuel, uh, videos.mygameforge.com. Fabulous videos on everything about golf and performance. So if, you're, if you are a golfer, you really... If, you're, if you want to go down the same pathway in golf as we're doing here with whiskey as well, I encourage you to jump that and all the speakeasy videos will be in there as well. But my advice to a young coach is just to learn. And also, I think the really key point is to gain knowledge, but do not give all your students all that knowledge as you're training them, right? Players want answers and how to. Over time, you can give them the back, 
uh, you know, go more into depth about what's happening, about what they do and how they do it. But they don't need to know every intricacy of the golf swing, especially if it doesn't pertain to what they're doing. Um, so what I say for a lot of younger golf coaches is try to keep it simple inside a presentation. Also, I think the number one issue is most coaches don't address concept issues. So if, if a player believes something's going to happen or if they do this, this happens or this, you know, there's a concept, right? Let's just say putting on fast greens. Some people think, well, I need to get really short with my putting stroke and accelerate to be able to navigate very fast putting green. The data shows is the opposite, it's getting longer, slower. So the concept is wrong. So even though I train them to do a certain thing, if they think this is what has to happen and they're gonna go apply that. And so everything we've trained and, and worked on to get better for certain situations, they might blow up just because they think that the concept is wrong or their, con or their understanding of a concept is incorrect. Uh, Again, a lot of players think, you know, to be able to hit the ball far, you know, that they have to lean way back behind the ball and try to launch it high. That's not true. Uh, again, if you move the club correctly and on the downswing, you know, you lay the club off a little bit and you kind of hit a sweeping motion into it, you don't need to be all your weight on your back. So that's a concept issue. They think I need to be on my back leg to hit it high. That's not true. You just need to move positions correctly. So to me as a coach, the number one thing you need to do before you move into any um, swing change or advancing them into different areas is make sure their concepts are right. And one B would be performance. Understand where they are, what their numbers look like, and what the next level looks like. I, again, we, we do a really bad job in golf. Well, I want to break 100. Well, what does that mean? Well, what that really means is you have 40 putts to the green and you have 59 shots to the green, right? 49, you have 40 shots on the putting green and you have 59 shots to the green, you break 100. How are we gonna do that? If you think of it that way, breaking 100 is actually pretty simple. Um, maybe it's just hitting a bunch of seven irons all day. Maybe it's you know doing things a little bit differently uh, so you don't introduce penalties and craziness. So again, if they don't understand those performance goals, which are also concepts, then it gets a little harder to judge and become a better coach. So to me, performance first, always understand that, but the concepts behind all those components are really important. Uh, fastest way uh, to shoot even par. It's very simple. If you wanna shoot even par, if you're listening to this, you have to hit at least 12 greens in regulation. You have to hit half of those inside of 20 feet, and then you have to make half of those for birdie. So that gives you three birdies. So we hit 12 greens, we miss, uh, 12, six, we miss six. Of that, we've got to scramble 50%. So of the six greens we missed, we got to get up and down three of the times. Three birdies, three bogeys, what does that equal? Even, assuming nothing crazy, that's how we shoot even. That's the bare bones of how to shoot even par. So the question is, if you're a player at home and you're you know, shooting 78, my goal is to shoot 72, how many greens do you hit? How often do you hit it within 20 feet? How many of these do you make? Opportunities, conversions. You need to think about that. If you don't know, go to GameForge, uh, www.mygameforge.com, uh, and you will actually see how that you can accomplish that, right? Also, let's say maybe you're hitting greens, you're hitting birdies, but you're walking away with six bogeys. Our up and downs aren't good enough, so how can we get those better? That's hitting it inside of six feet more often, converting better, opportunities, how many opportunities do I have to convert, yada, yada, yada. So again, it's understanding those components, and again, if you want to shoot even, it's simple. 12 greens, 50% inside of 20 feet, make half. Of the greens you miss, which is six, 50% of those P6 and make those three and three, you shoot even, golf is easy. Whiskey's hard, golf is easy. Uh, last one, how do I game plan for a tournament? Um, this is a big question, but what, what, what we advise inside of GameForge and me as a coach is you gotta set up for your training to prepare for the event you're going to. Don't be a Swiss Army knife training. Certain golf courses have difficulty off the tee, maybe it's an approach difficulty, maybe it's putting difficulty. Um, there's components of the golf course that are gonna be difficult. You need to train to be ready for that difficulty. Maybe it's the fact that my greens stay the same but I hit less shots inside of 20 feet so my birdies go down. Uh, maybe it's a course where penalties and fairways drop way down because it's really hard to hit it off the tee. So what we've gotta understand is, what does a golf course wanna do to us and how can we adjust to nullify what that's gonna do to my scoring? Right, so there's certain tournaments I know I'm gonna have less birdies because I'm gonna have less opportunities. Or the putting greens are so challenging that maybe I have less birdies just because how difficult it is. So 
me as a player, I need to know that. And as a coach, I need to make sure my player knows that. And inside of Game Forge, we have all that information for you as well, especially on the consulting wing. Uh, the consulting wing, we give you all this information to get ready and your team ready for tournaments, as well as uh, dossiers on how to play the golf course. So that gives you a concept there. We also like to see what distances do we normally have in for this golf course and train what we're going to see, right? So a football team trains to what they do well, but also what they can beat the other team with. It'd be dumb not to do that, right? Same thing in golf. So make sure that you're training and trying to get ready to compete and play against the golf course because that is your opponent. All the players on the golf course are opponents as well, but your number one component is the golf course. So you need to train and get ready for everything that's getting ready to happen. Uh, short game, practice from the grass as if possible, the length of grass, put pins where you think pins are going to be difficulty-wise. That all gives you that concept. So those would be my three golf questions that I, I received through the speakeasy which is kind of cool, different way of finding me. So let's do this again, and we're going to focus in on finish. Smells, I'm getting same smells, taste, I imagine the same, but we're going to see. So uh, if we talk complexity of this, I would say this is moderately complex. It's not the most complex. I don't get 50, 60 different flavors flying around for long periods. I get very instant three or four good flavors, and they come in waves. Um, so I would say, you know, complexity is moderate smell, I think is moderate. I can definitely smell multiple things. So I would say everything right now would be kind of in the moderate scale and then we'll go to finish. The cool thing about the finish is I get that alcohol bite. I'm curious to get the proof. I'm thinking a hundred mm, bites at me here a little bit there, but the cool part is I get that dry hit. And then it miles out. Mouth gets dry. So it's a drier finish. I would say a strong alcohol bite, then it miles. But it actually sits on the tongue for a little bit. So it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of interesting. It's not completely dry my mouth out. My tongue is still coated. My cheeks and all are like, oh, it's dry. But, but I would say, again, I would say kind of more of a mild, mild finish. Um, and again, I get no woody. I get a little bit of rye bite. It's a little bit there. So I think that's that cinnamon -y kind of bite. I do get a little bit of rye. And like I said, my second and third sips, I got a lot of cinnamon bite. So there's definitely rye. So I would say corn one, rye two, and there would have to be a barley in there for because barley is the ultimate um, enzyme creator. So those would be my top two. I'm just going through the list here. Um, I do get a little bit of whiny at the end. I don't know what type of wine, but I do get that sweet cherry note. Um, fruity wise, like I said, I, I get darker fruits. I'm not in the, so I'm getting more in the cherry grapefruit section. I don't get grapefruit, but I'm definitely getting cherry, maybe a little bit of plum. But you know, that's kind of what I would derive from the actual tasting wheel. Oops, but the cool part, again, I'm looking at legs, and they're there, and they're, they're not super thick, but they're not super fast either, so <coughs> I don't know. Let's see if I can, I don't know if you can see that, but that actually shows you kind of some of the legs there, the long, skinny legs. Uh, but again, to me, I actually really enjoy this. I'm getting wild turkey-ish in, in a wine barrel. I don't know if I'm right. <laughs> I'm probably wrong. But that would be my my tasting guess. So let's let's actually look here. Let's do a so a quick fire questions as I'm actually looking this up. Um, number one question is what is my newest whiskeys I've added to my uh, tasting or inside of my barrel here? I added Angel, Angel's Trace Rye and Angel Trace Bourbon, our finished bourbon. I was able to find those. Uh, Yes, I am 21. I was able to find those on my family vacation. Uh, the actual liquor store at the small town of Virginia where I had a great selection, a much better selection than here at, at Charlottesville where I normally go. So my new favorite hobby, I guess, when I travel is I'm going to go check out all the other liquor stores, see what they have in mind. Um, also, uh, I thought this was a cool question. This will be the last one. Um, do you belong to a golf course? Are you a member? Yes, I belong to Green Hills Golf Course in Standardsville, and I teach at a Birdwood Golf Course. And so basically they said, from your home course, how, what whiskey would you say your course reminds you of? 
kind of interesting question. Well, to me, Green Hills is more traditional. Um, so I'm going to go with a more of a traditional whiskey. Uh, the golf course, I think, is straight in front of you and fair. Can be difficult um, with the rough and the way that they grow it. But to me, it's a very smooth, easygoing golf course. Easier to score on than a lot. But a, a course that can jump up and bite you um, if you make mistakes. So I'm going to go an Irish whiskey. I'll go Green Spot, single malt. So the cool thing about every time I drink Green Spot is it's a little spicy. It's a little bowl for the Irish, but it is smooth. It's straight in front of you. It's a great whiskey. Uh, you either love or hate Green Spot. I'm kind of in the middle. Some days I love it. Some days I'm like, I'm not so sure about this. But I would say Green Hills would remind me of that as well because some days I play great. Some days I play poorly. Uh, so I think Green Spot would be a good whiskey um, for Green Hills. If I had to go American, it would definitely be bourbon, uh, probably wild turkey, just because I like to drink wild turkey. All right, so let's jump in here. We actually did sample A. So let's see here. I'm going to put my reading glasses on. I'll snap shots of these and add this to the video. Um, but this is actually called Three Chord, um, perfectly tuned whiskey. It is a straight bourbon. Uh, finished in Pinot Noir barrels. So I did get the wine flavor, that was cool. Um, proof, 99, so it's about 50% alcohol, 49.5. I could definitely taste that little bit of alcohol. And again, I can see the, the film on the glass. So I knew there was a higher alcohol count. Um, pretty cool, so let's learn a little bit about Three Chords Bourbon. They're based out of Chelsea, Michigan. Fun fact, the founder of this brand, Neil Gerlardo, is a guitar player and now the spouse to legendary rock icon Pat Benatar. Hit me with your best shot. All right, so the whiskey is called uh, is a strange collaboration uh, between the whiskey and a Pinot Noir finished bourbon. So that's kind of the, the cool piece of that. Proof is 99, age statement two to six. I figured it would be somewhere in there. Mash bill, corn number one. There was a the sweet, 75%, 21% rye. I got the cinnamon bite. The, the baking stuff, so again, I got the rye bite, and 4% bar barley, because you gotta have barley, right? Uh, they say the color of the parents would be a pale copper. I said it was like a pale amber. Uh, copper is probably a better term. Uh, they, they pay people really high money to come up with these, so we're, we'll give them the pale copper. Aroma notes, sweet raspberry, no, did not get that. Preserves, cherry. Melon, okay, so I got cherry, I got brown sugar, uh, Pinot Noir, Pinot Noir comes through um, with that sweet wine taste, or the wine taste, so I did pick up a little of the wine taste, not through the smell so much, I did get the cherry and the, and the sugar, but I didn't get it the wine through that. Tasting notes, maple, peanuts, strawberry, toffee, vanilla, oak, wafer, and clove. I got more cinnamon than clove, but I could see that. I got the maple syrup, the sweet out the gate. Definitely got the vanilla. Uh, he says vanilla wafer, but vanilla from the oaky barrel. I definitely got that. Finish, they say, is mild, mildly dry. Definitely dry. I would go higher than mildly dry. Uh, front and top palate, coffee, toasted wood, and ripe plum. So they get the plum in the finish. I get a little bit of cinnamon from the rye, but I definitely get that dryness from the alcohol. Um, this is what Brown, or, so let's go to the distillery story. Just three chord progression is that is the root of the blues music and the core of the three chord bourbon. A whiskey infused with a harmony of rich taste, well-balanced spirits is complex. Handcrafted bourbon is steeped with tradition yet revolutionary using its proprietary blend and process to, for whiskeys. So again, that kind of gives you an idea, uh, a quote from their founder. One night as I was sipping bourbon in my studio with friends, the conversation naturally turned to music, sound, and composition. We began to wonder how blending these tones of various whiskeys together could create a unique harmony of flavor. We knew, we knew bourbon's role in American music and American dream. We also knew we loved it. We knew that the blues and the three chord progressions were the blank score, and so we composed our own masterpiece with truth, heart, and integrity. That is the company. Blind Barrel gives you a, a, an idea as well. So um, sample A, again, is called Three Chord, and I'll snap a screenshot of that and pass that. Uh, would I recommend this? Yes, I think it's pretty good. Um, 
And I think this is what you're going to start to learn as you, your whiskey progression. The big boys are great. Definitely a great place to start. But there are a ton of craft distillers out there, smaller whiskey makers, especially inside of the United States. we got a couple thousand of them now. Um, so there's tons of distilleries out there. And I know inside of the state of Virginia, the speakeasy is going to hit the road soon and, and start to take you to some of these. But again, so to me, for my first blind, I thought it was pretty good for, you know, Neanderthal golf coach. Uh, I got the proof-ish. I got some of the flavor notes. Definitely got the corn and the rye in the, in the mix. And again, I've only been tasting now for a year and a half or so. So it doesn't take long to start pulling these notes out. Would I ever come up with three chord? Gosh, no. Uh, don't, never even heard of them until I just took that sip. But I will definitely look online and, and learn more and maybe order a bottle here in the, in the coming weeks um, to, again, expand out the speakeasy um, arsenal of whiskeys to try. But, uh, so I'm going to kind of wrap this video up again. This was our blind query show where we talk, uh, blind tasting queries of, of golf and questions from you. And, and again, just share our love of whiskey. So if you have any questions, definitely send them to me via, you can send it via email, uh, brian at mygameforge.com. You can send it through DM through the speakeasy. Uh, if you've got my phone number or text, you can shoot me a message that way. But I have gotten lots of really good feedback. And the really cool part is inside of our Fuel Performance Network podcast, um, typically we're losing about 10 to 15% of listeners when I produce a whiskey video. So the whiskey videos are actually highly listened to. Um, so we will continue to push those out there. I encourage you to uh, find us on the Speakeasy Mixing Passions uh, so I've kicked this off as his own podcast where you'll get everything. Most of it will show up in the uh, Fuel Performance Network, but you know, go ahead and like us over there. And if you can give us a five star so other people can start to pick this up, again, mixing passions of golf and whiskey together. So thank you again. As always, uh, keep moving forward and, and onward. And uh, until our next whiskey, my friend, have a good day. This has been a fuel production.